So now we come to what you can learn from evolution. So what has all the sequencing of uh, thousands of organisms and all the uh, advanced uh, evolutionary methods taught us? So of course we have a, some kind of tree of life here with different things are related. And we can try to discuss how, how it happened. So the current hypothesis is that somehow life probably started about 4 billion years ago. And that's quite soon after Earth, the Earth was created. And of course, life needs energy. And uh, it's believed that the first organism did not uh, did use chemical energy or heat or something. But not, they couldn't really use the sunlight. So, but quite rapidly, three and a half billion years ago, they have the idea that uh, photosynthesis was involved. Photosynthesis requires quite a lot of complex chemicals, proteins, so quite early. And then sometime two and a half billion years ago, there was the last universal common ancestor. So that's the idea that that time there was uh, one organism that was the origin of everything that exists today. And after that we have three kingdoms of life, I will come back to that later. Half a, million, half a million years ago, it was, it was, it was called the Cambrian Explosion, so there was many more species, so it, was, it took a long time for all these speciations, plants and animals and things like that to occur. And then, finally, the oxygen levels arose quite significantly 200 million years ago, and that allowed many more land and living animals to have uh, used much more energy. So how did life start? It's most people believe that the first time of life was like the RNA, and the main arguments are probably that RNA is the only macromolecule that can both catalyze and self-replicate. So the idea is that somehow something started it and created RNA molecules, and they become close to some kind of membrane-like things, and they could particularly produce everything they needed to replicate themselves, so you could couple yourself. And uh, then later, quite early of course, because basically all life today, except viruses, have uh, DNA as a replicating, uh, as a genetic information. DNA was, it was switched from an RNA genome to a DNA genome. And then basically all organisms do the same thing. They have translation, transcription, Replication using similar machines, not exactly the same, but in basic, very, very similar. So most of the components of the molecular body we have today are very, very old. Some of the ideas, this is, this is a famous experiment, experiment called the Miller Early experiment, and basically it goes out to that you have an idea of that you have that somehow some of the basic chemical components necessary for life, like amino acids and maybe nucleotides, could occur spontaneously by just having some uh, organic matter and some uh, energy, some sparks or things like that. So, it's very clear that today we have three billion, three like kingdoms of lives. So we have bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes. Now, Kia is a bit interesting because they were discovered very recently in the 70s. And uh, um, they were discovered by sequence, yeah, by sequencing, by isolating what people thought were very primitive bacteria from uh, very strange environments like very hot ponds or very salty mines and so on. And they. Uh, uh, and people thought that these, they were similar to what, what could have existed for in the very early life. That's why they were called to be Archean. But uh, later studies show that they are, are certainly is not more Archean than any other species. And they are, if there's something, they are probably a large part of them are more similar to eukaryotes and prokaryotes. But they created three separate groups of eukaryotes, Archean, and bacteria. But they are forced, they don't have any nucleus and so on. But there are some. Uh, very recent studies showing that there are some special subgroups there that is, has a number of the specific machines that are only found in eukaryotes. So, 
another big example when you could use uh, for logic to figure out the uh, question was about the giant pandas. So is that a bear or a raccoon? They look like bears, but have features that are unusual for bears and typical for raccoons. And they do not hibernate, for instance. So this was used by Stephen O'Brien and colleagues in 1985. They took 16S DNA or 16S RNA and uh, sequenced that from bears, pandas and raccoons. And it came up with this kind of evolutionary tree, showing that it's clear that the, the, the giant panda is much more similar to the bears than it is to the, uh, to the raccoon. So the, it's, uh, as you can see here, you have like a good example of the tree. We have the brown bears and polar bears are quite recently separated by a few million years. The black bear, the much smaller one, is uh, similar, is maybe separated five million years. There's some spectacle bear, I think, lives in Asia. That is uh, maybe separated by 10 million years. And then the giant panda is maybe by 20 million years. But the raccoons were separated at least 35 million years ago. This was a red panda, but that's just another type of raccoon. But it's quite distant from the raccoon also. So this is the type of information you can get from just sequencing, in this case, a single gene, and the, but in this case, it probably holds up. And if people wonder where grizzly bears and are doing that, it's just another type of brown bear. They're separated by just a few hundred thousand years or something. So we have the tree of life like that, and we have to see, for instance, so what is the closest relative for us, the animals? Well, this actually fungi is a very good one. So this is very good in modern organisms. We see that it's very, it's actually the closest thing you have to any animal. Yeah, so this is the archaea. So it was also developed by 16S, 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 